Let's open our Bibles today to the book of Luke, chapter 19. This is traditionally Palm Sunday. It is the beginning of Holy Week, of of the week of Jesus' passion. And so it is uh, pretty common that on this particular Sunday, we look at what began the week. It is what, what is called Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And so I want to do that today uh, in a bit of a different uh, context. Because I want, to, I want to talk about one point on his journey into the city. We'll talk about what takes place in this entry. But as he comes into the city, he has to pass through. Because Jerusalem was a walled city, he, pa- he has to pass through one of the gates that surrounded the city. One of the eight gates that surrounded the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So let me read beginning uh, here in, uh, in Luke chapter 19. I'm going to read beginning in verse 28. When he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples saying, Go into the village opposite you, where as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as he was loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosing the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven. And glory in the highest. It, that is out of the 118th Psalm. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. We know historically that this literally happened a number of years uh, after this after this particular occasion. I want you to just notice a few things here in setting the uh, stage for the message today. I want you to notice the, the 37th verse. The whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice. Notice these words. For all the mighty works which they had seen. For all the mighty works which they had seen. These were people who were uh, receivers of the manifest presence of God. They had seen God at work with their own eyes. And out of that, they quote the 118th Psalm as a song of praise and worship. Notice verse 40. Jesus says, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. 
it's just important to understand the, 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 the power of this setting here. In which G, this isn't just sort of a by the way event that's taking place. Actually, this idea of the triumphal entry of, of Jesus is specifically to fulfill a prophecy that he is in fact the Messiah. Verse 41, I think it is telling that as he draws near the city, he begins to weep over the city. If you had known, even you, especially in this your day of the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. I wonder if, if, if this kind of, um, of scenario is not true in terms of even a nation like ours. If you had known in this your day of the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes because we ourselves live in this nation in the middle of some pretty traumatic times. Sometimes when it seems like godlessness is not just on the rise, but it has completely taken over in this land. And if you are a faithful follower of the Lord, you're not just in the minority. It seems as if you are in, there is every intention to cancel you and to cancel what you stand for, and to cancel your voice. Notice the, the 44th verse. And in, in the, in the Lord saying, here's what's going to happen as, as a result of your rejection of the Messiah. And then he ends by saying, because you did not know the time. Because you did not know the time of your visitation. God help us as those who are his in the middle of this kind of day in the land that we live in to, um, to be those who are tuned in to the voice of the Holy Spirit that we have understanding like the sons of Issachar. We, under, we have understanding of the times. We're not so controlled by the day or so intimidated by the day that, uh, that we're just doing everything we can to survive the day, but that we pray for an understanding of the Spirit that in the middle of this hour we might know what is the day of our visitation. Because God is seeking to come in every day, in every day to break through in His power and glory. The, the base, the, the, the foundation of this message today is centered around this one gate in the walled city. It is the eastern gate. As Jesus makes his journey down into the city, he will pass through this gate. In fact, during the week of his passion, it is the same gate that he will go back out in the evenings as he comes into the city and then he goes back out into the evenings to, the, the Bible says, Mount Olivet and then he will come back the next day, go back out. It is also the gate through which he will pass before Calvary the last time. This time he comes as a prisoner because in the Garden of Gethsemane he has now been arrested and he is taken through this gate. It is the eastern gate. It's also called the Golden Gate because of the hue of the sun upon the stone in the wall. If you would look at it at a certain time when the sun would shine, it would, it would shine as, as golden. It's also called the Beautiful Gate. We have in these, uh, in these last weeks of time been... Uh, in a message series on the idea of hope 
and it's taken out of 1 Peter 1. I'm not going to read there again today, but every week the idea of this hope in 1 Peter because Jesus says, you, or, or Peter says, you have been begotten again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. A living hope, living hope. It is that word that separates this idea of hope from every other definition that we have. When we talk about what hope is, we define it in, in all of the, the ways that we could to describe what hope might be in terms of a future, what hope might be for something that we want to see happen or whatever. This idea of a living hope uh, causes us to examine it to say, what does that mean? Because it is directly tied to something supernatural. The idea of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This idea of living hope is rooted in the promise of God. In John 14, Jesus will say, because I live, you can too. We are one week away from the celebration of the resurrection of Christ. On a Friday, everything looks dark. Looks like there's no hope. Uh, there is a, a, a Saturday, a Friday, Jesus dies on the cross. There's Saturday, there's nothing that takes place. It looks like everything is over, but on Sunday, there comes the, the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ. Because I live, you can live too. The idea of living hope is rooted not just in a resurrection, but in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's also rooted in the power of God because out of death comes life. And that's why uh, Peter will tell us that there is a, a resurrection inheritance that is yours. It is reserved in heaven for you. And when we come to, uh, we come to think about, to, to, uh, to look into this idea of this inheritance, it's not just someday after this life, but it is that which is living now. So the question is, how does it affect how I live and what I live for in the middle of a day like this? So I want today to, uh, I want to take you to four different times in the scripture in which this gate comes to play a prominent part. There are more. I, I just chose four for this message today. Four occasions because... Uh, I titled this message, The Gate of Hope. Now, that's not a... The, the Bible doesn't call the Eastern Gate the Gate of Hope. I'm calling it that for the sake of this message. But there's four occasions of living hope, in my opinion, that are associated with this particular gate in the Scripture. The first one is found in Ezekiel chapter 43. It, uh, I'm, I'm going to call it the gate of glory. The gate of glory. Ezekiel chapter 43, verse 1. Afterward, he brought me to the gate, the gate that faces toward the east. That's the eastern gate. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. It was like the appearance of the vision which I saw, like the vision which I saw when I came to destroy the city. The visions were like the vision which I saw by the river Chebar, and I fell on my face. Now notice this. And the glory of the Lord came into the temple by way of the gate, which faces toward the east. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. I want you to just sort of visually today to, in your mind, to see this idea of, uh, of somehow the presence, the glory of God coming from the east, coming through this gate 
and into the temple where the glory of God dwells. It would be, uh, maybe you have uh, heard of a term that's not in the Bible, but it is coined for what would be here, the manifest presence of God called the Shekinah glory, the Shekinah glory. It is a physical manifestation of God. It's the visible manifestation of the presence of God. It is the majestic presence or manifestation of God in which he descends to dwell among men. Whenever the invisible God becomes visible and whenever the omnipresence of God is localized, this is the Shekinah glory of God. In the Old Testament, if you, if you take a journey through to discover the times of the Shekinah glory of God, uh, most of the time they will come in the form of light or of fire or of a cloud or a combination of those. But in the, in the New Testament, there's a new form that appears in John chapter 1, verse 14. It is the incarnate word, the presence of God. The, the, the concept of the Shekinah is behind the wonder of the incarnation, the very glory of God. Here's what the Bible says. The very glory of God tabernacled with the inhuman flesh and was handled and beheld, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Remember Jesus said in Matthew 28, He said, I am with you always. So to each of these uh, looks, Throughout the scripture, these four times of, of this particular gate, I've written a sentence that brings it to some application for all of us. So what is the big deal? If this is the gate of glory, if the, if the Shekinah glory of God came through this gate and, and and came to the temple of God, what's the meaning of that for me? It is this, the gate of glory speaks to the promise of God's abiding presence for you. The gate of glory speaks to the, to the promise of his abiding presence. See, you're living in the middle uh, of a world in which the presence of evil in our day is more and more prevalent. You don't have to look far. You don't have to be really spiritually discerning to see the kinds of things that are taking place in this day that are the pure manifestation of evil. In the middle of that, in the middle of an evil day, the triumphal entry of Jesus as he comes through that gate. That gate historically speaks of the promise of the abiding presence of God for you. That even in this day, all of these years later, for you in the middle of a dark world, there is the abiding presence of a supernatural God that's there for you. Second picture is in the text that we read today. It's the gate of triumph. Luke chapter 19, John chapter 12, Mark 11, Matthew chapter 21. It is what is called the triumphal entry, and it is Jesus riding on a donkey. The significance of the donkey is, is it would be known as, uh, as mercy, Mercy. Think of the word mercy. Jesus riding on this donkey. And uh, what's interesting, as Jesus makes his way into the temple, now look, 
there are, there's, particularly in our day, if we're going to talk about the conquering king, we would not talk about the conquering king entering the city riding on a donkey or anything the donkey represents. Because that would, that would diminish his glory. I mean, if somebody said that, you'd say, you've got to be kidding. You know, what, are you, what are you talking about? I mean, what's that? But Jesus comes in that way, humble. Or if you're from Texas, humble. <laughs> Don't use any more letters than you have to in those words, I guess. I'm not, not quite sure where you get that one, but. What is, uh, this, is this is the feast of Passover. And so, the reason that Acts chapter 2 takes place in the setting it does, when the, there comes the outpouring of the Spirit, and there are all these languages that are present in the outpouring of the Spirit. People hear them speak, and people who didn't know any languages speak their own language, praising and magnifying God, is because people were gathered from all over for one of the major feasts of Israel, Passover. They had gathered in Jerusalem. For this day. What happened every Passover is that uh, Rome, Rome had a procession of its own. Jesus rides into the city on the east side, but the procession of Rome comes in on the west side. The, the procession of Rome uh, those, there are foot soldiers and there is the cavalry, those mounted on horses. And there is the representative of the emperor who is riding at the head of the column. He's entering Rome for the Jews to know that are gathered there from all over the world that there is the power present that is keeping them in subjection, subjugation. They're serving Rome. So when Jesus comes into the city, from the east side, there is the procession of Rome coming in from the west side. There is two kingdoms present. There is the kingdom of God that Jesus is ushering in, and there is the, there is the kingdom that is presently in charge that keeps all of the people under its thumb. Two kingdoms. When Jesus comes into the city, two kingdoms will collide. Two ruling systems, two different value systems. All of that will take place. That is the scene that you see as Jesus comes through this eastern gate that's here. Pilate's procession displayed not only imperial Rome, the imperial power, but also Roman imperial theology. According to this theology, the emperor was not simply the ruler of Rome, but he is the son of God. On the eastern side, you have the procession of the kingdom of God. It is the son of God, the Messiah, the promised one, whom the Jews expected to show up as a mighty conqueror, throwing Rome out, uh, uh, setting them free, earthly free again. And instead, this king of glory is coming into the city. The kingdom of God is being ushered in by the Son of God riding on a donkey. If you had looked at both processions, they were in stark contrast to each other in every way possible. Because if you only looked through these eyes, it would be obvious that, that the Roman procession was far more powerful than the one of the kingdom of God. You have Jesus coming in to go to Calvary. 
And so the sentence I wrote for this is, the gate of triumph speaks to the promise of his life conquering death. The gate of triumph speaks to the promise of his life conquering death. The third gate, the third gate that symbolizes that, 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 that there is this eastern gate, another occasion in, in the history of this gate, is found in, in the book of Acts chapter 3. It is the gate of miracles. The gate of miracles. Acts chapter 3 says that Peter and John are on their way to, to the temple at the hour of prayer. And as they come by the gate of the temple, there is, in fact, it will say by the gate of the temple, by the gate beautiful, this eastern gate, there is a lame man sitting there, has his cup out. He's begging, asking for pennies. He's been sitting there as long as anyone can remember. As from the time he was old enough for them to carry him, he's been sitting there with his cup out. It's all he's ever known. It's all he'll ever, he ever will know. All of his life, I mean, all of his future. He has no hope. He has no hope of a future any different than what his present reality is, he is crippled, lame. And everything about his circumstance says nothing will ever change. He, remember, he is sitting here at the gate where the, the Shekinah glory, the Shekinah glory of God has passed this way before. He is sitting at the very place where the God of glory came through the gate to reside in the temple of his dwelling. Now, at the entrance to the temple, there is a lame man. It's not only that the Shekinah glory has passed this way, but Jesus the Messiah has made his triumphal entry right by this spot. Here is a crippled man. He represents the brokenness of the human heart. He represents the brokenness of the day. He represents your brokenness. He represents the impossibilities, the things that people look at and say, well, there's, there's, there's really no hope at all. Nothing will ever change because this is how it is. He represents human frailty. He represents the cripples of the culture, whatever they might be crippled by. Now on this day, two men who have been with Jesus come by and he holds out his cup as he always did. Just expecting to receive something so that he can survive until the next day. Whatever it is, just a little bit. Maybe, maybe you've driven by one of the the turnarounds or the underpasses or the intersections in our city or any of the other significant cities in our nation, what has become what we what years ago we would never have seen, but now is absolutely common. We see it everywhere around us, somebody holding up a sign. Anything helps. Anything. It's all they hope for. Whatever their condition happens to be, whatever got them there. It isn't just the, the physical lameness. It is what happens in terms of a lost identity 
or, your, or a lost perspective on life or, or significance. Now you're holding a sign. Anything helps. And it becomes defining. This is, let me say it again. This is the place where the glory, this is the place that had been marked by the glory of God. It had also been marked by the entry of Jesus who had gone to Calvary and had risen from the dead. Now it is marked by a cripple that represents the brokenness of the day. Two of those who had been with the living Christ come by, and it is there when he holds out his cup that Peter says, we don't have any money, but what we do have we'll give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. And the Bible says immediately his feet and his Ankle bones received strength, and he jumped up and began to run and to leap and to praise God uh, as loudly as he could. The gate of miracles. The gate of miracles speaks to the promise of his power over what has produced a lameness. The gate of miracles speaks to the promise of his power over what has produced a lameness. And the fourth, the fourth uh, picture of this gate is, um, is a gate of promise, a gate of promise. It is, we started with the gate of glory, the Shekinah glory, the gate of triumph. It is Jesus coming in, proclaiming the kingdom of God in the face of what seems a far more dominant kingdom of this world. It is also the gate of miracles where the power of God is displayed. And then it is the gate of promise. Same gate. This eastern gate. Uh, would you put that picture on the screen? This is the gate. Uh, right here. Those, uh, the opening to those gates are walled in. The actual, the actual gates... Uh, we presume are somewhere underneath this. These are gates that would have been built on top of what has never been archaeologically uh, uh, exposed. Because remember, Jerusalem was leveled. AD 70 was leveled. And uh, so there, uh, the, Jerusalem is destroyed, the walls are knocked down, gates are... And uh, in 1517, there were some attempts to rebuild along the way. The Turks conquered Jerusalem uh, under the leadership of Suleiman the Magnificent. So he commanded that the ancient walls be rebuilt. This is what tradition says. He heard rumors beginning to sweep through Jerusalem that the Messiah was coming. So he called together some Jewish rabbis and he asked them, he said, tell me about the Messiah. What? What do you know? And so they described the Messiah as a great military leader who would be sent by God from the east. They said he would enter the eastern gate and he would liberate the city from foreign control. So 
he decided that he would put an end to Jewish hopes by ordering that the eastern gate be sealed. So that's what they did. They sealed the gate. And then he put a Muslim cemetery in front of the gate, believing that no Jewish holy man would defile himself by walking through a Muslim cemetery. All of this was the effort of a man who somehow thought he could prevent the Messiah of God, the conquering king, from entering the city. In Revelation 19, we're told that when Jesus returns, he will come as a victorious military conqueror. He will be riding through the air on a supernatural white horse. I want you to see the imagery. In Isaiah 61, we're told that he will come from the east. And in Zechariah 14, we're told that he will touch ground on the Mount of Olives. That the promise to you and to me and to all who have come to faith in Christ, that one day he will come, he will come again through the eastern gate, this time riding on a white horse. I want you to see the picture, the imagery. On, at the triumphal entry, he entered the eastern gate riding on a donkey. And as they celebrated him, he was crowned king for a day. He didn't look like much of a king after that. He would be betrayed. In fact, he would speak to his own death. He would be betrayed. He would be arrested. He would go through a mock trial. He would be whipped. He would be nailed to a cross. And on his head would be put a crown of thorns. King of the Jews. He was crowned king for a day. But one day. See, when you're when you're looking at the things in life, wondering if things could ever change, when you're looking at this hour, wondering if there's any hope in the middle of this kind of day, what you need to do, the Bible says, is to lift up your head, for your redemption draws nigh. Because one day he will write again through the eastern gate. But this time, the Bible says, on a white horse, as the conquering king of kings. He's coming again. Psalm 24, prophetically, will speak of this king who is coming. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. The Bible speaks prophetically to the walling of that gate and that there will come a day when that walled-in gate will be opened will be open for the entrance of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Messiah of God that will once again come to this earth to set all things right. The gate of promise. Interesting, isn't it? That one gate has all of this history. One place 
of egress into the city has all of this history that symbolically has meaning for you in terms of how you live. The gate of promise speaks to whatever has blocked the possibility of the entry of the life of God. While I keep my eye on a coming Redeemer, I'm living in the middle of a world in which I, I am surrounded by everything that hell wants to bring my way to thwart, to, to stifle, to stop, to block the very purpose and plan of God. The gate of promise speaks to every one of those with a loud message. Whatever is blocking of the promise by the effects of man or by the demonic working of hell itself or the, by the breaking of life, the king of glory is coming. There's hope. This is a gate of hope. A gate of hope. Acts chapter 1, you remember when the disciples are gathered, Jesus is there, he will ascend into heaven. And as he goes, he says, I want you to know that this, it isn't all over. There comes an angelic messenger that says, as you saw him go, he's coming again. He is coming again, breaking through. No grave no blockade, no scheme of man or of hell will triumph. No circumstance, no demonic power, no evil intention of man is greater than the resurrection power of Jesus. You have been begotten again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Because he lives, you will live also. He is your coming king and triumph. Because he is coming again, he is also here now. The Bible says he is everywhere present. You, you have been begotten again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It is established in heaven and it is for you as you walk through this time of life. And it is based on these words. Saturday was sad, surely it was true. Since when is impossible ever stopped you? For Friday's disappointment is Sunday's empty too. Since when is impossible ever stopped you? Come on. This is the sound of the dry bones rattling. This is the praise make a dead man walk again. Hope in the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of the dry bones rattling. 